Good morning. We'll find our places today. Yeah, we're good. We'll find our places this morning and we'll get started. It's good to see you today. And on this just this beautiful spring weekend, we're glad to have you. We've got a special part of our service today. And that is we're going to recognize our graduates. So that's coming up in a little while. But I just want to make sure everybody gets a chance to get in and get settled so that we can start worship together. All right. Yeah, it was like that last week. It's chatty in here, which is good. That's wonderful. To, I like that it takes just a minute to settle everybody down and get ready to worship. We're here, you know, when you come to worship, we are here for the Lord first and foremost, right? That's why we've come. We've come to give Him glory and honor. You need a little more volume from me? Crank me up. Give me a, give me a little more. The pe people usually are trying to turn me down, but... You can, uh, I like this because I can control it, right? There you go. All right. When we come to worship, we come first and foremost for the Lord. Do you believe that? Amen. But we also come, part of the reason for our gathering is the fellowship of the saints together. And so it's so good to see people talking and fellowshipping and encouraging each other. And now we're going to sing to one another and we're going to sing to the Lord. So I want to encourage you to just give the Lord your heart this morning. Give your worship. Give him praise. Give him glory. And just from this very first song, lift, lift your voices. We'll, lead it, uh, we'll let Aaron lead us now. Let's stand together as we get ready to sing. The Bible says in Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Oh uh -huh. 
the Lord is good, for oh, blessed is he who hides in him. Oh, fear the Lord, oh, all you saints, forgive you everything, forgive you everything. Amen. Are you thankful for Jesus this morning? Are you thankful for God? To God be the glory, great things he hath done. church
God's blessing on our service today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and each and every day that you give us. Thank you most of all for the new life that we have in Christ Jesus. We ask and pray, Lord, that you'd bless our service today in a very real, powerful and personal way. We pray, Lord, that we would, you would draw each of us, Lord, closer to you. Lord, help us uh, as we sing these songs to be mindful of the fact that first and foremost, we're singing unto you. And so it's an act of worship. Then we're singing to one another, praising and bringing you glory. Lord, help it to bring, to build us, each of us up in the faith. We pray for those that are not able to be here today, maybe some that are not feeling well. We pray that, Lord, you'd put your healing hand upon them and Help them to feel better, restore them to our fellowship, those perhaps that are at work. Help them to sense your place, be your person at the workplace. Those who are traveling, watch over them, give them traveling mercies. But now, Lord, we pray that just move in the service in a great way, whether it's here or those that are watching on the live stream. Help us, Lord, to leave different than how we have arrived. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, let's just take a quick minute this morning and I just want to mention the connection card. If you have a prayer request, it's an opportunity for you to turn that in. And we do come, part of our worship is to bear one another's burdens. So if this connection card is for those who are new to our church or for our church family to put prayer requests on. So if you just take a minute today and you can leave that in the offering box on your way out this morning. Um, but that's But make sure that you take a minute for that. And then some of the upcoming events this afternoon, our ladies uh, have a coffee meetup planned in Williamstown at Tunnel City. That's at four o'clock. So I want to encourage the ladies to come and just enjoy. A, it'll be a relaxed but encouraging time together uh, just for about an hour or so at four o'clock this afternoon. Um, there is a sign-up sheet out there, and uh, we've got a good group already planning on being there. But I want to encourage you to try to make it out this afternoon. Um, and then you also see that uh, we're looking for some volunteers for some positions here at the church to help serve in different ways. And we put those cards out a few weeks ago in the bulletin and um, uh, did not get a whole lot of them back just to, to be uh, upfront with you. So if you have a chance, we have them. If you say, you know what, I could serve in a way, take a look at those and take a card off the table out there and uh, get involved in some way. We'd love to Love to plug you in. Uh, next Sunday night is going to be our church, our first church family campfire night. So you're invited to my house. Deborah and I would love to host you. We're going to have the whole church gather next Sunday. There'll be games and activities, and we will have hot dogs provided. So bring a snack, bring a dessert, and we'll share just a nice time of fun and fellowship and then worship around the campfire next Sunday night. So I hope that you can come, and you are welcome and encouraged to bring a guest with you. So um, not just for our church family, but if you have a, uh, a friend or someone you'd like to bring, come on and bring them out. All right, we do have other things uh, that you'll notice in the bulletin, a few more announcements, but we've got something special this plan for this morning. And I want to invite, we have several uh, college graduates in our church. Last year, we had 
a whole big group of high school graduates, but this year we have several that are graduating or have already graduated from college, and we want to just take a minute in the service and recognize them. So I'm going to ask them to come up. We'll start, we'll have all of you come on up, but let's have our two ladies come on. We'll, ladies first, we'll have Maddie and Trinity come up, and then Mike, come on up, Major, John, come on up, John, and um, who's my other one? No, it's five. These are the, there were five. Just make sure I didn't miss anybody. All right. This is, this is just an awesome group of young adults. Don't you agree? And I'm, I'm just really, really proud of each and every one of them. And each of them has had a big part to play in our church. Now, sometimes in churches, when you have young people like this come up on the stage, um, you can't say the same thing about all of them because some young people are just attend church casually, some are involved at different levels, but each and every person, man and woman that you see on this platform today have been a huge part of Mount Greylock Baptist Church. And they have served our church through their college years and high school years for some of them and before high school years for one of them <laughs> and have just been a huge blessing. So I want to just really quick, and I have another microphone here. So you just grab me one. Is that on? So we, you all know John Chen. John, why don't you tell us a little bit about the de what degree did you just get? Associate degree in business and administration. And that was from Northeastern Baptist College. And where are you headed now after graduation? Um, I'm going to Taylor University to pursuing my uh, bachelor degree in engineering. All right. Taylor University is a Christian university in the Midwest, and John is headed there. And um, John has been a huge blessing, especially especially in the music ministry of our church at different times. And John is somebody that's encouraged me, not just when he's ministered on the, at the piano or in song, but he's encouraged me from the pew in his participation in worship. And um, conversations we've had, we're just really proud of you, John, in a godly way. And we're excited about what the Lord is going to do in your life. And we're glad that we've just been able to be a little part of it. So thank you, so thank you John. I know you, you were ahead of me. but he, You just left him hanging there. He was trying to get a fist bump from you. But there you go. Now, I couldn't just let that go. So Mike, um, the, Mike's story is amazing because Mike is in large. It's all by the grace of God, right? But Mike is a Christian in large part because of some of the young people in our church. And it's really a lot to do with Maddie LaRoche, who invited him to church her freshman year at MCLA. And Mike got saved through the witness of our young people at our church. He got baptized in our church. And after, well, tell us, well, I'll say my part, then I'll give it to you. But Mike felt that the Lord wanted him to stay here at Mount Greylock after graduation and continue to grow in his faith here and get his adult life started. So Mike is, Mike is sticking around. We got a hold of him and we're so glad for that. So Mike, what, tell us about your degree and about what the Lord has for you next. Um, I have a degree in health sciences with a minor in business and I'm going to be sticking around here as Ethan said and then I would like to go into the ministry. Yeah, Mike feels that God is, that God might be calling him into the ministry. And so it's amazing how God works that like, um, the, who would think that we, we always think we, we send young people out to Christian colleges, but God used, God used MCLA and the outreach of not just the people up here, but, but some of our young people, Cal and James and Adam, super faithful ministering on the campus there. And God, God raises up servants everywhere, right? And so just, we're so excited, Mike, and glad that uh, God has led you here. So praise the Lord. Major, Major was noticed the very first time he walked in. He came here as a, as a freshman football player for Williams College. And um, 
Major has been a, a, he's had a quiet impact on our, on our church. And he's been faithful in, we've had work days where he's showed up here. He's been faithful to all of the, all of the services all throughout. Faithful in other ways that you wouldn't know necessarily. But as a pastor, I'm aware of other ways that Major has just been a super faithful um, person. And it's, it's so easy, and, and we've seen it over the years, it's so easy to see people go to college and kind of have a casual relationship with a church. But Major has just plugged in, and he's functioned just like a regular member here, and we've loved having you. And we couldn't get him to stay. We couldn't keep him. So we have to send him out. So, Major, tell us, tell us all what you've accomplished and where the Lord has you next. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the church family. Um, I'm from, like, southwest Virginia, so I'm a bit far from home. And this church has really acted as a family to me. And I'm thankful for that. Um, got me through college i now have my bachelor's uh from williams college and i'll be going to maryland just outside dc um so if you're in the area uh come say hi look look for major next time you're in dc yeah. and your field of work will be in government work right with yeah. your major has a degree in russian and linguistics degree uh it's in russian and political science russian and political science so be very interesting it's it's amazing god uses um, it's so important, like Daniel in the Old Testament, that we have well-educated Christian people in important places in our, even in our government. And so that's a, it's a different ministry that God's called you to, but it is a ministry and you'll serve the Lord there. So we're excited for you. Thank you, Major. And for a little while longer, Miss Maddie LaRoche, but as most of you know, Maddie is soon to be Mrs. Najimi, as she and Cal uh, uh, are wed in September. So we're super excited for that marriage. Amen, church? It's awesome. Um, Maddie came here as well, freshman year at MCLA, and I feel like you were here first or second Sunday of the semester. It was pretty early, and she showed up with mom and dad. And it was important for them, I think, to get you settled in a church and, um, and has just been a huge blessing. Maddie has served in our children's ministries here. Uh, she's looking forward now to, being the, to, te to leading our junior Sunday school class with Cal alongside. And um, no offense, Cal, but that's an improvement to your class. So, but no, no offense at all. <laughs> Um, so pray for them as they, uh, as they prepare for their marriage soon, and uh, we're glad that we got to keep another one of you guys. So, Maddie, tell us a little bit about what your academic journey, obviously you started at MCLA, didn't finish there, and then tell us what you're going to be doing this, this year. Yeah, so I graduated from Bob Jones with a degree in biblical counseling and a minor in worldview studies, and I'm going to be teaching fourth grade at Grace Christian School in Bennington, Vermont. All right. Oh, you didn't know that, huh? <laughs> John's like, oh, that's cool, right? So that's, that is awesome. So congratulations to Maddie. All right. And last but certainly not least is Trinity Flynn. And it was, uh, how old are you now, 23? 24. 24. So it was 16 years ago, I think it was that we knocked on your door at Crossy Place in North Adams and wanted to see if this little girl and her siblings wanted to ride the bus to Sunday school. And that happened. The Lord led her here and Trinity grew up in our youth group and went to Pensacola Christian College, getting married on June the 15th, is it? 27 days, but who's counting? <laughs> 20, it's the, 27. In 27 days, how many hours or minutes? Do you, you don't have that? I don't know. <laughs> we don't know yet. And many of you got to meet uh, her fiance, Andrew. He's visited here a couple of times. Um, so tell us, Trinity, what, uh, where the Lord has your next steps. Yeah, so I graduated with my bachelor's degree in elementary education with a minor in early childhood education. And me and my soon-to-be husband, we are moving to Fort Walton Beach, Florida, as I begin my career as a kindergarten teacher at Calvary Christian Academy. All right. So congratulations, Trinity. It's 
wonderful. So the, the scripture that I'd like to share this morning is 1 Timothy 4 and verse number 12. And the Bible says, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. And we give glory to God that each and every one of you in your unique God-gifted ways has been an example to the rest of us. And we like to think that we have had an impact on you all, but we know that you all have been an example to us and you've had an impact on us. And I think that any young people in this generation who will stand and will live for God are really our heroes and our people that we should celebrate that. And so we're so thankful, and, and it says, let no man despise thy youth, but be an example of the believers in your word and the things that you say. In conversation, that means the way you live your life. In charity, that's in your love, in your spirit, in faith, and in purity. And so as you take this next step, I just want to encourage each of you to be dedicated to the Lord, to continue the testimony that you've established. You've started well, and now continue well. Continue to walk with the Lord and continue to be an example and continue to serve. Let's pray together for God's blessing on their lives. Lord, we thank you for your sovereign plan over each and every one of us. Lord, the story of each life is just a masterpiece that only you have, could have put together. So I thank, I thank you, Lord, for how you've led each, each of these graduates. I pray that you'd walk with them. I pray for John, Lord, who you brought here from across the world. Lord, I thank you for his family that raised him to love you and I thank you for Grace Christian investing in his life and the Ko family hosting him and being a blessing to him. And I thank you, Lord, for the blessing that John has been to us. Lord, as he prepares to go to Taylor University, God, give him a just a continued passion for you, a hunger for you. Bless him in his studies. Lord, lead him in his next step. I pray for Mike and... I thank you for answering so many prayers, even these last six months, that he needed, Lord, to see you come through and meet needs that he had. And Lord, we give you glory and praise. I thank you, Lord, that uh, he's going to continue to serve here at this church. And I pray that you'd help him bless his, his career as he, uh, in the company he's working for, bless his further training. Lord, give him clarity as to the direction for service in your kingdom. Help him to know exactly what steps to take next. I think of Major, and I pray that you would just, um, ju that your anointing would be on him as he goes and, Lord, serves our country in, in a unique capacity. Would I pray that you'd help him to be, continue to be just a bright light wherever he goes. Thank you for his dedication and his service, Lord. Please just use him. I pray for Maddie, and I pray that you would I thank you, Lord, for all the souls that she has influenced and the people, Lord, when, when she led the Christian Fellowship at MCLA, the, the people she impacted and really the legacy she left behind. I thank you, Lord, for just her wonderful spirit of encouragement and would help her as she um, adjusts here to life in the Berkshires and as they prepare for their marriage, Lord, uh, that she and Cal would just endeavor to put you first. Bless her upcoming school year and this transition and the lives that she's going to impact at Grace. Lord, please help her. We thank you for her, Lord. Thank you for Trinity. Lord, I just thank you for, for where you've brought her. Lord, I just, just is a, so many miracles along the way. So many people in our church that you've used to, to help her, and, and she's been such an encouragement to us. Lord, it's hard for us to see her move away, but we're excited for where you've called her and or we're excited for uh, the life that you've given for her and Andrew. Please bless their, their marriage. Please help them in this new school and church that they'll be a part of. Calvary, Lord, just please bless there. So, Lord, we dedicate them to you. We thank you for them. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. We have a gift for each of you. This is a devotional, and this is experiencing God day by day. We'd like you to have this and remember uh, the church here at Mount Greylock Baptist, how much we love you, how much you mean to us, and we want to encourage you with this in your walk with the Lord. So you guys can come on down. Let's thank them, church, and we'll give each of you one. Amen. Well, let's just uh, still our hearts for just a minute as we think about the offering today. We'll be giving to the Lord, and we want to thank Him for how He's blessed us financially. Do note the missionaries of the week, which are the Mortensen families. There's some specific prayer requests, how we can be praying for them. Uh, they had a, a wonderful medical outreach, and they bring... They, br they brought doctors and nurses down, and three of the patients received Jesus Christ as their Savior. And um, continue to pray that as their church, it's interesting, their church is trying to be, a, is, is a missions church. So we can pray for them that way. But take this, I love uh, these missions updates. My wife very faithfully takes these and pins them to our refrigerator each week. And she and our kids during the day will lift up these missionaries and pray for them. I encourage you to do the same, and we'll take a minute to pray for them uh, this morning as we dedicate our offering to the Lord. So let's bow our heads in prayer. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Cal, why don't you come on up as you guys get ready to sing. And uh, you can ask the blessing on the offering as well. Lord, we thank you for this day that you have given. Lord, we pray that everything we do here would honor you, God. We pray that as we give back a portion of what you have given to us, Lord, that it, we would do it as an act of worship, Lord. You would put our hearts in the right spot, Lord, when we give this back to you. Lord, we pray that you would use the money we give, um, both here in this church um, and, and throughout the world. God, we pray for the Mortensons. We pray you would bless their ministry. God, we thank you for these three souls that, that you have called to you, Lord. We just pray you would continue to bless their ministry, Lord. Bless their outreach and their missions giving as well. God, we pray that you would use everything we give you for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together one more time as we sing Shepherd. Though I walk through the valley and I can't see the way When the shadows surround me I will not be
please turn to Matthew chapter 19 again this morning. I'll dive right into the message quickly today because we've got a little bit of a late start and very important topic and it's very relevant into the days in for the days that we live in. So I'd ask you just to give me your full attention this morning. We'll give the word of God your full attention, I should say, and think with me. This will be a message that is is requires us to do a little bit of thinking as we think through culture. I'd like to talk with you this morning about a, having a kingdom culture. Obviously, the study that we've been in, in, in the book of Matthew, has been about the fact that we belong to Jesus' kingdom. We don't belong to the kingdom of this world. And so that affects our view of culture. And I want you to understand right from the beginning that culture and Christianity have always had a, a very interesting relationship. There are things about our culture, and really every culture, that are beautiful expressions of the image of God that he has placed in our hearts. And in fact, if you've, I don't know how many of you have, but several of you have been able to travel to different cultures in the world and you've experienced some wonderful things that are maybe a little bit different than what you and I experience in our American culture. You can go to different parts of the United States and experience different cultural uh, expressions. And many of those things are wonderful and they remind us that we were created by a wonderful, creative God who is magnificent and he creates people with diversity and uniqueness in both personality and temperament and expressions. And so there's wonderful things. And so in that way, the kingdom of God has been in wonderful harmony with culture throughout history. In fact, many of the beautiful music that we enjoy is a result of Christian influence on culture. Many of the art and architecture that we enjoy in our culture has been influenced by Christianity. And so there's this interesting relationship between culture and Christianity. On the one hand, they go together quite beautifully. But on the other hand, in every culture where Christianity has found itself, there have been things that have been countercultural. There, there have been aspects of Christianity, there have been aspects of the, of the Word of God that have run head on against the cultural norms of the day. We feel that pressure and that tension in the time in which we live, don't we? Do we feel that pressure where the things that we believe, the things that we value at times are coming into direct confrontation with the cultural views of our day? Just nod with me if you're, if you're tracking with me. We're, we experience that. Jesus dealt with this in Matthew chapter 19. The Pharisees were experts on bringing loaded questions to Jesus. If you study the life of Jesus, the Pharisees would try to give him a really difficult situation. And so they bring a culturally loaded, controversial topic, and they lay it at Jesus' feet, and they say, oh yeah? Well, what do you have to say about this? What I am just so amazed by and encouraged with is that Jesus, don't, Jesus never misses a beat. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't vacillate. He doesn't back down. He confronts it directly and square on. Now, we'll see some application. There's, we're going to see directly what this is teaching us today, but then we're going to also take, make a few more applications. But go ahead and look with me in Matthew 19, and look at verse number 1. It came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coasts of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Well, that's a problem for the Pharisees, because there's too many people. There's too many people that want to go along with Jesus. There's too many people showing up for the teaching. There's too many people showing up for the healings. So the Pharisees say, let's shut him down. And so the Pharisees, verse 3, also came to him, tempting him. Let's see if we can trick him. And they said to him, 
Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? That's what that says right there. Is it, is it lawful for a man to divorce, to put away his wife for every reason? This was a culturally loaded question. Because to understand the context of the day, these were very legalistic people. And by that, I mean that they very, very carefully obeyed all of the laws of Moses. However, they were not just experts at obeying the laws of Moses, but they were experts at finding loopholes in the law of Moses. They loved it. They were like, and so this was the culture of the day, powerful, lustful men, this is the reality, this is who they were, powerful and lust-filled men grew tired of their wives. What they did was they looked in the Old Testament and they said, well, Moses gave this law that we could divorce our wives. Oh, well, that solves this little problem I have in their cold, calloused, hardened hearts. They said, you know what? I don't, I'm not happy with my wife anymore, so I think I will divorce her. This was happening in the day. But obviously it was controversial. You can imagine that was controversial, that that was disruptive, that it was terrible. But they would say, oh, but it's allowed. But it's allowed. And so G they want Jesus to... to <laughs> To borrow a popular expression, they're hoping they can take this loaded issue and that Jesus is going to step in it, as they say. They're just hoping to trip him up with this. But can I share something with you? Jesus is not afraid of our cultural anxieties. Jesus is not afraid of, well, I hope I don't say the right thing, the wrong thing to upset this group of people. He's not afraid of that at all. And so he tackles this issue head on without any apology. He just goes right at it. And, and look what he says to them directly. He sa and I, I lost my place. He says to them, well, haven't you read, in verse number four, he goes right back to the scriptures. Haven't you read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be what? One flesh. How many? But before that, how many parties are involved? Two, and then they are made, two are made one. Verse number six, wherefore, they are no longer two, but now they are one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say to him, well, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Why is this allowed in the law? Jesus says to them, Moses did this because of the hardness of your hearts. He allowed you or he suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, God's plan from the beginning. Notice how many times this is twice now Jesus is appealing to what moment in history? Creation. The beginning. The beginning. The beginning. Where do, where, so because of where Jesus is pointing us, where should Christians get our understanding of these things? From where? The beginning. Genesis. It's not my opinion. That's what Jesus is pointing us to. The beginning. From the beginning it was not so. Verse number 9, and I say to you that... Anyone whosoever will put away his wife, unless it's for fornication and marries another, commits adultery. And whoso marries her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So Jesus tackles this head on. He is not afraid of the cultural issue of the day. The specific cultural issue of the day is divorce and remarriage, right? But did you notice in this passage that Jesus did not only address divorce and remarriage, but, and I'm thankful for this, he addressed all of the principles behind the man and woman relationship in this passage. Not only does he answer their cultural quandary, 
but he answers just about every sexual quandary that cultures have faced time past. It's all here. And so what I want you to see this morning is this. First of all, let's understand what a culture is. And you can find many definitions. Just do a, a simple internet search. And in this one I found to be particularly helpful. Culture. This is on the bottom of the first page of your notes. A culture is a way of life of a group of people. The behaviors, beliefs, values, and symbols that they accept generally without, what's it say? Thinking. Without thinking. If you, if you surveyed the, the vast majority of people and you asked them, why do you believe what you believe about this issue? Most people would not have an answer for you. And I'm embarrassed to say that if you surveyed many people in the church, I hope it's not most, but I know that it's many. If you surveyed many people in the church and you said, well, why do you believe these things that you believe? Many Christians wouldn't be able to give an answer. I had a conversation with a pastor not long ago and a local pastor, good, good man. And he said to me, he says, I'm just in the culture in which we live. He said, I'm just worried about our churches that I'm worried are Christians equipped. Are they equipped for the cultural pressures that we're going to face? And so it's both. But but because that's how culture works. We are raised up in cultures where we inherit a list of presuppositions and assumptions, where we just inherit these ideas and we just we react based on how we feel and what feels normal to us and what doesn't feel normal to us. But God has called believers to be thinking people, to be rational people. And listen, I think it's a testimony to not just to this church, but it's a testimony to the families and the leaders of this church and the other churches represented by all these young people that were up here before. It's a testimony for the influences in their life that you do not stand on a stage like that at you know, 19 to 25 years old. You do not stand on a stage like that with a rock solid testimony for Jesus unless you have been trained to think about spiritual things and ask difficult questions. And Jesus is not afraid of it. And the church cannot be afraid of it either. We must embrace the battle. But I, that's why I love that song. I've always loved that song, uh, O Church Arise, that we sang today. And put your armor on. And the, the, I won't recite the lyrics for sake of time, but there's so many great lyrics about the way in which we approach our culture in, in this day and age. So kingdom culture. And you know, it's a beautiful thing about a local church is that we all can raise our families together as a distinct culture in the culture that we're in. That we to, can come together on Sundays and Wednesdays and in life groups and in, you know, like, you know, it's like, why do we have something, this is just a little side note for free to encourage you to go to church events as often as you can. Why do we have a, a, a women's coffee meetup on a Sunday afternoon? Or why do we have a campfire night at, at our house? Or why do we schedule these extra, extra events? It's not to fill social calendars. It's to create a Christian community. It's to say that we are a people who, come, yet we, we all know that during the, we are going to have to go out into the world, but we are not of the world. We have a, a, we have a special way of thinking and we have a, a wonderful plan for life that Jesus gave us. And we're going to come together and fortify our faith together so that we are equipped to go out into this generation. So a kingdom culture. Let me give you on the back of your notes, and I'll try to move through this pretty quick. Let me give you four principles first for Christians as we engage the culture. Maybe make a couple notes next to this. First thing goes, should go without saying, but Christ is king over culture. Who is king? And what is Christ? He is who? He is king. He is the king. 
if we just remember that, that we belong to Jesus. We don't take positions. How many of you are, you know, you Christian, you need to take a stand. You need to take a position on, or politician, you need to take a position. We don't take positions. We just receive them from Jesus. It's not up to us. It's, it's given to us. I, I think it was Martin Luther when he was challenged by the Pope back in those, in those Reformation days. He said, here I stand. I can do no other. And if only the, in the church today needs that. We have but one master, and that is King Jesus. And if, if, if this is what the word of God says, that is what my life is based on. Because he is my Lord. He has given his life for me. He is my king. Christ is king over culture. Right there. But I want to give you a little bit more, too. This is important as you converse with your friends and skeptical family members. The creator. Did you remember in this passage how many times Jesus kept going back to where? The beginning, the creation, the creation. That is because the creator knows what is best for human flourishing. I shared this a little bit last week. God set up Adam and Eve in the garden and he brought the man and the woman together. And then he said, be what? Fruitful and multiply. He said, and he, and he gave them a garden. He put them in a place where they could flourish. He said, be fruitful, multiply, keep the garden. The creator has, has designed human beings to flourish. But sin attacks human flourishing. It is not that Christians, Christians are, and again, there's context to all these statements. But we are not against everybody. We are for everyone. We are not against anyone. We want everyone to flourish in the way that God created them to flourish. The world wants to paint a picture that Christians, that we're trying to stop everything. We're not trying to stop everything. We are trying to promote God's wonderful plan for humanity. I am so for God's plan that I have to be against whatever would mess it all up for us. And challenge, I would challenge the skeptics and the people who struggle with Christian, Christ, the, the cultural problems with Christianity. I would challenge the skeptics. Do you believe there is a creator? And do you believe he has revealed himself? Then does it not stand to reason that that creator would know what is best for his creation? Think of a very simple and inadequate illustration. If I allowed all of my children to eat whatever they wanted every day, what would those poor kids look like? Well, some of them would be supremely malnourished and, you know, skin and bones because all they consumed is sugar that did nothing. And others would be, you know, well, you can imagine what kind of condition they'd be in. It wouldn't be pretty. They'd be emotionally a mess. And the same for me. Because children need an authority in their life who understand the bigger picture, would they be uneducated? <laughs> right? Just go down the line. If we just did what came natural to us from the moment we were born into this world, if we only did what came natural to us, with no authorities to guide us, this was a popular belief system in the 1800s, the, the uh, romantic and transcendental views, and Henry David Thoreau that just put mankind in his natural state and he will flourish. It doesn't happen. In our natural state, we self-destruct. God has created an order to the universe. And so those people that chafe against and, and, and bristle against Christian teachings, I just want to encourage those people to just evaluate, is it possible that you don't know what is best in the universe? <laughs> is it possible that you don't know more than God? Would you at least consider that and begin this journey of investigation? Thirdly here, we must be culturally relevant, Christians, but never culturally relative. Do you understand the difference? What I'm trying to do today with this message 
is be culturally relevant. What I'm trying to do is say, here is how the Bible applies to the day in which we live. We must always do that. We must never be so withdrawn from the world in which we live that people don't even understand what we're talking about. It does us no good to study, you know, soteriology and bibliology and theology if we don't look at how that impacts the world in which we live. We have to be relevant to the culture, but we must never be relative to the culture. And by that, we never subject our views of truth to the prevailing cultural winds. We must never do that. And then fourthly, we need to be courageous and compassionate. Did you catch that? There's a lot of people, there's a ditch on both sides of the road. There's a lot of people who are courageous about their cultural stands, but it's crystal clear that they don't love anybody. They just want to beat that drum and just want to say, well, things ain't how they used to be and you people are wrong and you're destroying our country and, and all of that. And there's no compassion for the person who is really not just the person who's committing sin, but the person who is the victim of their own sin. The Bible says that we speak the truth in love. And so some people, though, are all compassion. And what happens when you're all compassion and no truth is you cave to pressure. You cave to family pressure. Many people have changed their Christian views because of a family member's lifestyle choices. Many people used to believe something about the scripture, but their brother or their sister or their son or their daughter made a lifestyle decision. And now that person, filled with compassion and love, has caved and been unfaithful to the king. Because one day we'll stand before our king. So we need to be both courageous and compassionate. But speaking the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 15 says. So those are the principles from which we give you the second half of the message now. Jesus explicitly in this passage deals with human sexuality. Are you with me? So Jesus in this passage deals with what it means to be man and woman in this passage. Okay? Now, look at what Jesus... Now, I want to make this note as well. Biblical teaching on sexuality has always been countercultural. This is not... I, I shared this a little bit last week. We are not in a new moment in the grand scheme of things. Every culture that you, found, you find yourself in, what the Bible teaches about human sexuality is counter to the culture. Just think about it. In ancient times, powerful men with money would accumulate harems to themselves. Is that God's plan for marriage? Of course not. In the Roman days, there was great sexual freedom of expression in the Greek and Roman empires. And they would practice all kinds of things. Christianity came and said, no, that's counter to that culture as well. Even in the times of this New Testament writing with the faithful Jewish law keepers, they had corrupted God's view. Even religious people that have an outward conformity had corrupted God's view with their, with their no-fault divorce teachings in this day. It doesn't matter where you go. I was reading some things about Victorian England recently in a, in a history book that I'm reading. And in, Victoria, in Victorian England, in that time that we think of as such a sexually pure time, it was commonly known that many men were promiscuous so long as no one knew about it. It was a culturally accepted sin that people could be outwardly faithful to their spouse and what they did in their secret lives, everybody kind of knew it went on and nobody talked about it. You say, Ethan, what's your point? Again, to be a little bit repetitious, I think it's important, especially for some of you who are a little bit older. You preach to the young people a lot. Let me preach to, a little bit to the older group. There has never been a golden age for Christianity. It's never happened. There's never been a time where the, the culture has been 
it, it might have been, there might have been a religious culture or a culture that looked more, but there's always been major problems with our cultures. They, the battles just look different. The issues are just different. Every generation has its own cultural moment that it has to engage. And for you and me, and for churches in this 21st century, human sexuality is the dividing issue right now of Christians who will be faithful to the word of God and Christians who will not. You say, well, that's not the only thing. Well, it's not the only thing, but it's the main thing that you see right now. It's the main issue. So what does the Bible actually say? I'm just giving you a survey right now, a simple outline. There are many more references that we could look at. But in Matthew 19, Jesus gives us a very simple outline of what God's design for sexuality is. First of all, we saw in our text in verse number 4, we see in our text, in Matthew 19, 4, that God created humans as two distinct genders. At the beginning, he which made them, made them what? Male and female. This appeal is to creation. God made two distinct genders. Our culture has, there's a whole movement in our culture that has given us a huge menu option of gender decisions. That is not, that does not line up with the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ or what's revealed in the Old Testament. Okay? God, is, God has created male and female. Now, again, people today might, and I was prepared to, let you say, well, would you preach something like this if there was, what if there was somebody in our church that didn't believe that? Not a member of our church, of course, but what if somebody came to our church and was visiting? Would you say this? I absolutely would. But I would say it with this spirit of love and compassion. It says, listen, I say this to you because you are created in the image of God. And what you may be struggling with, don't look to the world's answers. The, 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 the difficulty you have intellectually with, with understanding your gender, don't look to human answers. Look to God's answers. Because God's answers are what are going to give you fulfillment and satisfaction. And the answer of God is what is going to give you peace. And can I help all of us as a church? That's how, and I need to be convicted of this too, when we see things that we don't like or that bother us, we need to look at that person, and rather than, be, rather than be just upset in our minds, we need to have compassion. And our hearts need to be broken. Because God has created a beautiful plan for each and every person's life. And the devil is sowing seeds of confusion among society. We, are, we have an opportunity to be a bright and shining light of love and hope for people. But God cre but but we don't compromise on that. We're courageous. And we say, Christians, we understand that the world will do what the world does, but as believers, we understand that God created us male and female. Secondly, marriage is defined by Jesus and by Genesis as the lifelong union. Of one man and one woman. That's Matthew 19 and verses 4 through 6. We read it already. Verse 5. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, cleaves to his wife, and the two of them become what? One flesh. That marriage is a physical and spiritual union. Whereby two are no longer two, but are now one flesh. There are not different kinds of marriage. There is only marriage. Right? And, and you cannot say that, and there are some Christians that have, there are some Christians that have tried to work out a compromise. And they've said, well, there can be, you know, as Christians, we believe, so there's, there's true Christian marriage, 
But then we can also have civil marriages that the government does. And I've heard Christians try to walk that line. We can have marriage, but then there's civil recognitions and civil marriage. As soon as you, as soon as you do that, you have fundamentally denied what marriage is. Because marriage is defined by God as one man and one woman for life. Thirdly, and this is the one that rubs the church, needs to rub, the church culture hasn't always embraced this. Thirdly, as is the exact point of the passage we're teaching, divorce is prohibited among God's people. Divorce is prohibited except in extreme cases. Divorce is prohibited except in extreme cases. Those of you preparing for marriage, the in, in your, your um, engagement period, you are, you are not married yet. You are in the final proving ground to determine, will I be committed to this person for the rest of my life? This is that final proving ground for that. Because when you stand before God, and when you stand before the community of other brothers and sisters, you are making a solemn covenant to God and to others that you will be faithful to this person as long as you both shall live. That's a covenant you're making. So take the engagement period seriously. Those of you who are preparing to, for a rela- you'd love to be in a relationship, be very careful who you start dating. Because very casual, flippant dating can lead you into relationships that you never thought would happen. You should be dating for marriage. Preparing for marriage. Okay, this is this is this goes counter to a lot of even church culture that's that goes on today. But in your youth, God didn't there's there's only there's only one man there's only what is it, three male female relationships? You're like, what do you mean? Three male female relationships. Mother and son, brother and sister, husband and wife. You won't find any other male female relationships. And in the church, it's the same, actually, spiritually. Treat the older women as mothers and the younger women as sisters. There is no boyfriend-girlfriend in the church. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong to use that term. I, I understand. But it is an important thing to realize that. There are only th- three relationships. Mother and son, brother and sister, husband and wife. So you need to look at each person. If you are not married to that person, that is your sister or brother in Christ. And you treat them as such until you're willing to vow your life to them. That's Christian marriage. Now, the disciples, if you're like, wow, that's kind of extreme. That's what the disciples said to Jesus. (laughs) Literally. Like, I'm getting ahead of myself, but look at verse number 10. His disciples are like, whoa. Verse number 10. If it's that serious, maybe we better not get married. Now, I'll come back to that in a minute. So go ahead, let's back up to where we were. But it is, it's really serious. And I feel that Christians have lost a lot, of, a lot of credibility to speak on sexual issues in the world when we don't have our own house in order in the church sometimes. Right? So, these are principles. This is what the Bible teaches. So, a distinct Christian culture in our generation. Divorce is prohibited except in extreme cases, and the Bible explains what those are. In fact, if you look at what Jesus said when they asked him, well, why did Moses allow for divorce? Divorce was created in the Old Testament as a protection for the women. That's what it was. It was a male-dominated society, and if a man were to abandon a woman in those ancient times, she had no means to provide for herself. So divorce was actually given to protect women from scumbag men. <laughs> Literally. Like this guy is, is no good. He won't care for you. So you have the protection of legal divorce and you can be remarried. And so as we wrestle through what is, and this isn't, the whole message isn't on this. Many Christians have written on, on this. 
when we wrestle through what is an allowable reason for divorce, what is not, we need to put all of that in, in perspective, why this was given and what the biblical case is. But it should be very seriously considered among Christians. You say, well, Ethan, what, I've already been divorced. This, this has already happened. Well, Jesus specializes in redeeming our bad decisions and setting us back on track. So don't, don't this, this doesn't, this, this doesn't mean that God has now put you aside. Of course not. There's a wonderful next plan for your life. But that doesn't, we should not, but because of that, for fear of, I should not be afraid of offending someone who's been divorced to the expense of promoting among our, our young marriages how vital it is to avoid divorce at all costs. You see what I'm saying? Like, we have to be courageous and compassionate. We need both. Because, after all, Christ is king, not culture. And then this is really interesting. The fourth bullet point here. This would help our culture a whole lot. Jesus teaches that our primary identity is not sexual anyway. Did you did, think about that for a minute? We know he created us as sexual people. Gendered, male, female, sexual passions and desires. But he says that that is not our primary identity. In fact, even in the, the epistles, the scriptures say, well, in Christ there is neither what? Male or female. Now that can be twisted. It's, you, gotta, you put it in with the scripture. The point there is this. Your main identity is not that you are a man or a woman. Your main identity is that you belong to Jesus, that you are his. In fact, in heaven, Jesus teaches that we will not have these sexual relationships. There is no marriage in heaven. Because all that we, I, I don't know why, but I can only surmise that all of the joy and fulfillment that we get from our union with our spouse is fulfilled in what is greater union with Jesus. Because our primary identity is knowing Jesus. Our culture is consumed with the idea that we must have sex. I mean, just think about that for a minute. That is a cultural obsession, almost that you are less than human if you, don't, if you are not sexually active. Almost like there is something wrong with you. But did you eat? Now listen. Sex is a gift of God in marriage. The Bible teaches that one flesh is a physical th thing. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with it. It's wonderful. But if, if you were to be single you're in celibate your whole life, you might be missing out on a human experience, but in the grand scheme of eternity, you haven't missed out on anything because you were not created for sex. I say that because some of you, many of you are single. And some of you are single hoping to get married. Some of you are single with no prospect of marriage. You're not created for sex. That is not, that, like, if you are not sexually active, you are, it's okay. I feel like, like our culture needs a big you know, smack with that. It's okay. You're, it, it's like we don't treat anything else that way. We're not like, we, we celebrate other things. Like if somebody, is, if somebody uh, is deaf, do we make them feel in our culture like they are less human because they can't hear? No. We celebrate them for that. You see how our culture picks and chooses what they want to celebrate and what they don't want to celebrate? Jesus, you say, this is kind of weird now, Ethan. You're getting kind of weird on me. Why am I doing that? <laughs> Why am I doing that? Because what Jesus is about to say next is a passage you probably have heard preached very few times when you've ever gone to church. Because Jesus is about to talk about people who do not have sexual relations. Right here in the Bible, in front of everybody. He's going to talk about that right now. And what he's teaching us is that sexuality is not our primary identity. Look at what he says. He says in Matthew 19, verse 11, he said unto them, all men cannot receive this saying except the ones to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs. You're like, what is a eunuch? Well, a eunuch is... In, in many times, in ancient cultures, eunuchs were people who had their, their to be blunt, to be medical, their sexual organs removed. 
They were, they were, it was a common practice in the ancient world. It was brutal, but it happened. There, there are famous people in the Bible, like Daniel, who was a eunuch. Okay? So we talk about people who struggle with sexual ideas and sexual identity. Listen, if, if you are a mess about those things internally, and, you do, and I'm speaking to people that might be in the church where you're like, well, I know the Bible says this is wrong, but I feel this way, I feel that way. One of the best things you can do until you get all that sorted out is just say, I'm just going to not be active in that part of my life right now. I'm just going to step back from that. I'm going to pursue other things in my life until God works this out in my heart. That's good counsel for people that, that struggle with gender identity and, and, and sexual orientation. That's Because look what Jesus says. There, were some, there are some eunuchs, Jesus says, who were so born from their mother's womb. They were just born that way. It's a physical abnormality. And that's just what they were handed in life. And there are some which were made eunuchs of men. Somebody sadly did this to them. But there are others, and I believe this is a spiritual sense here, I don't think this is a physical sense, who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. What did those people choose to do? They chose to live celibate lives so that they could what? Devote themselves to the work of God. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 7. He says, there are some people that have the gift where they will not pursue romantic relationships. They will fully give themselves to the work of the Lord. So many of you grew up with your experience of nuns, right? Now, that is an unhealthy extrapolation of this passage. But at least you have to admire someone's personal dedication for what they believe in, don't you? Right? At least give them, and they, they do get that from this idea here. So I'm not saying that that whole thing is great, but you understand my point there. Is that, that that's the idea that, that my life will be dedicated, because you know what? I am not, I was created for a higher purpose. And so our culture teaches things about like, well, if you're not in a relationship, you should find pleasure in pornography and in things like that. Don't do that. Dedicate yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. Be wholly committed to him. Now, why does all this matter so much? And you're like, Ethan, why are you talking about this today? Some of you probably are, like, are thankful that we're addressing it, and other people, it might make you a little bit uncomfortable. I'm sorry if it does. But why are we talking about this? Because this is an issue that we cannot just not talk about. Our society is pushing it on us. It's making us pick a side. The easiest thing... And in fact, you're going to drive, you can drive down River Street right now, and in just a few weeks, you can go up and down Main Street, and you will see rainbow flags everywhere. And you will have friends and coworkers, and maybe even in some of your places of business, that will encourage you to change your profile picture and all of these things. This is the culture we live in. And, and, they, and, and you will be made to feel that if you don't go along, you hate people. We know that we don't hate anyone. But we love Jesus and we love other people too much to just be silent about this. We can't be silent about it. The easiest thing to do as a church would just be to be like, well, let's pick another passage to talk about. Let's just kind of skip over this one. There's a lot of other things we could talk about, right? But in my mind, it's in our series, so it fits with where we're... And it's this time of year that we'll be confronted with this. So it's so important for you to, because I don't want, I don't want our church to be known as, as a church that would not be courageous. But I also don't want us to be known as, a, as an angry, bitter church that's against everybody. I want us to be a church that, that, that people say, well, no, yeah, it's unmistakable what they believe. It's crystal clear that they're not going to compromise that issue. But it's also amazing how much they love people and how much they care. Let both things be said about us. Why it matters so much. So let me finish with this. Why does it matter so much as long as somebody believes the gospel, right? As long as somebody says, because Ethan, there are churches that wave the, the flag. So... As long as they believe in Jesus and that he saves you, 
And why does it matter? Isn't this, is, could this be considered a secondary issue? Like, you know, there are churches that have different types of music, and there are churches that use, you know, different versions of the Bible. There, isn't this kind of like a secondary thing that we can, like, work out among ourselves? Afraid not. This is a dividing line issue. This is a crystal clear dividing line issue. Why? A couple of reasons. One, we commit idolatry when we fashion God to our image. So back to, you don't have to turn there, but you can, re, in your free time, read Romans chapter 1. When we determine, when, remember, this is going back to the Garden of Eden. God created us a certain way. If we reject God's pattern, who have we made God? Ourselves. We can, can the clay say to the potter, why have you made me this way? The problem is when we change these things, these are not matters of interpretation. These are matters of biblical authority. And is God God or do we make God who we want him to be? And one of the, you read Romans chapter 1, one of the evidences of an idolatrous people is sexual perversion. It's in Romans chapter 1. Secondly, why is it so important? Because the gospel is lost if we can redefine what it means to be human, fallen, and in need of salvation. The gospel is lost if we define what it means to be fallen. If we can say, well, this is not sin, this is to be celebrated, then what about other things about us that we can just redefine? Jesus came to save us from our sin. If we erase all of what sin is, we lose the very heart of the gospel. Thirdly, it's unliving, unloving to allow men and women to suffer the consequences of their sin. It is actually unloving for us to stay quiet. It's unloving for us to say, well, we don't want to make waves. We are just going to sit this one out. That's an unloving thing for us to do. But let me, let me finish with this. The good news is there is cleansing in Jesus. There's cleansing in Christ. This is a beautiful passage. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 6. This is where we're going to end. 1 Corinthians 6 and verses 9 through 11. The Corinthian church came out of a culture a lot like ours. All the believers in Corinth lived in a culture a lot, a lot like ours. And so Paul says to the church, he says, Know you not, know ye not, don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, that's, a sec that's sexually promiscuous people, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate or abusers of themselves with mankind. That's, that's more archaic language for homosexuality ex explicitly in that passage, those two phrases at the end of verse 9. In fact, some of your translations, if you're using a different translation, it might say that, men who practice homosexuality. Verse number 10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, and such were some of you. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, I know we had a little distraction a second ago, but let's get back on track here. And such were some of you. Right? That means that in the church in Corinth, get this now, in the church at Corinth, there were people who their lifestyle used to be involved in all of those things. The church, the church there was made up of people that were, that in their previous life, they were sexually far, far away from God. He said, some of you, this was your lifestyle. But now you are what? Now you are what? 
sanctified. Now you are what? Justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Jesus came to redeem sinful people. We can't ever forget that. We get so focused, we get so focused on how far gone maybe a culture is that we forget that that is why Jesus came. He came to save those people. He came to save those people because we are those people. My sins may not, I may not have the same list after my personal history, but we, but all are people for whom Christ died and the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. He can cleanse you. He can pick you up. He can make you right. He can make you whole. And that's the message we need to bring to this world. Let's bow our heads for prayer right now. Has bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you're in here or you're watching this live stream and maybe God has convicted you. Maybe you had wrong views about these things. Maybe you've been confronted by the truth. Listen, sometimes the Holy Spirit confronts us to show us how desperately we need him. I shouldn't say sometimes, always he does that. Always the Holy Spirit shows us where we're wrong so we can find forgiveness in Christ. Would you give that area of your life over to him? Maybe God is using that to bring you to salvation. Maybe there's a wrestling in your heart and a wrestling in your soul that you'd say, well, I would become a Christian, except I'm unwilling to admit that that part of my life is wrong. Don't let that keep you from salvation. There is no sin, there is no pleasure, there is no lifestyle that is greater than knowing Jesus. Would you right now in your heart, wherever you are, repent of your sin and say, Jesus, I don't know how I'm going to change. You're going to have to change me. But I want your cleansing. I want your forgiveness. I believe in you and you alone. Would you pray that to the Lord right now? I believe there are many people, the thing that's keeping them from turning to Christ is they're holding on to their sexual sin. They won't let it go to find forgiveness in Jesus. Will you repent of that this morning and give your life to Christ? Christians, how about you? Are you tempted to not be courageous? Are you, are you tempted to just hide from the fight? Maybe there's somebody struggling with these things in their own life and in their heart. And for whatever reason, God has allowed you to deal with these internal struggles. Well, he will help you through them. You just need to surrender to him. You just need to say, Lord, no matter how I feel, I will trust you. No matter how I feel, I will obey you. Let's all take a moment now and just commit this teaching to the Lord's work in our hearts. Would you just, just pray where you're at and ask God to continue his work in your life this morning? Thank you for how you speak to us. I, I pray that you give us just crystal clear vision of what your plan is for us. Lord, help us to be strong and bold in this day. Help us to live for you. Help our children, our grandchildren, the children of this church to Lord, just continue to walk in the truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand together as we sing our church cries. Arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the 
thousands of years we thank you for the sword that makes the wounded whole God I pray that we'd go armed this week with your word with your love bless us as we go today in Jesus name Amen